Hello, everybody, and welcome to my talk. I'm Mark Hauser, and I'm the author of the new book, Multi Stories 55 Antique Skyscrapers and the Business Tycoons Who Built Them. And this is a book that tells the stories of, as it says, 50 American antique skyscrapers and then five bonus international antique skyscrapers. And not just the stories of their architecture, but more importantly, the stories of the people who commissioned them, the business tycoons, the, uh, the, the executives from that gilded age where fortunes were being made and cities were being transformed by this new American technological invention called the skyscraper. Now skyscrapers started out in Chicago and New York, um, both about the same time and both cities like to uh, argue which of them uh, is the original creator, the location of the first skyscraper. We can have that argument all night long and there are points or case to be made either way. We won't bother in doing that because what I think is more important and what is the point of my book is that New York and Chicago get a little bit too much love. And that is to the detriment of other cities that also have fantastic skyscrapers. Now, I'm a Pittsburgh speaker and writer and the first skyscrapers that I saw were here in Pittsburgh. And we are fortunate enough to have some very lovely skyscrapers that are more than a century old. So every city across the United States has an example or two. So what I wanted to do was find the nicest, most beautiful, most lavish, dazzling, old time skyscrapers from before the era of the Empire State Building, from the very first years of skyscrapers in the 1890s and the 1900s, the first, the aughts, and take a look at those skyscrapers, find the most beautiful ones that you can still visit today. So this is a travel documentary as well, places that you can go to look at these gorgeous buildings and think about a time when these buildings were exciting new technological advancements. You know, it's a time now where we've got new skyscraper technology sprouting up across the world and in New York and Chicago especially, but in other cities too, these new super tall buildings. And they're arousing some opposition from residents that they're wrecking the skyline, changing the way people are used to seeing New York or Chicago or other cities around the world. And so what I'd like to do is sort of cast our mind back a hundred years and more when the first skyscrapers appeared and see how they changed American cities dramatically. This is a view of New York from the Hudson River in 1912. And what you can see here on the left-hand side, the tallest building is the world's tallest skyscraper. That was a building that opened uh, or was being finished uh, with its construction that year. It opened the next year in 1913. And it was built by Frank Woolworth, who created the famous line of uh, discount stores, Woolworth. This was the second tallest structure in the entire world at the time of this picture. Uh, the tallest would have been the Eiffel Tower, and it would have reached up to about the top line of this image. So pretty much the tip of it would have been touching the top of your screen. So that's a good comparison, but the Woolworth building uh, was an amazing piece of construction. And when you look at it here, you can see obviously it dwarfs all the other buildings. It's right at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge next to City Hall. But you'll also see in this picture other tallest buildings in history because this is a picture of technological change that is occurring so rapidly that people can hardly keep up with it. I told you this picture is 1912. You can also see the world's tallest building in 1908, which is this strange looking gem called the Singer Building. And you can also see the world's tallest building in 1899, which is Park Road, this sort of uh, building on the left with two towers, two twin cupolas. And so though it looks like a nostalgic image to us now, you need to think about this as something that is demonstrating to the people that were viewing this postcard in 1912, massive advances in technology. This is over the course of just a little bit more than a decade, the height of the tallest building in the world, basically doubling, two buildings kind of across the street from each other, basically, uh, across the block rather. So if the person taking this picture 
or the person viewing it when it first came out on this picture postcard had had a time machine and been able to go back 40 years, none of these tall buildings would have been there. And the tallest thing they would have seen in the, in the image would have been the steeple of Trinity Church in Lower Manhattan on Broadway, which was the tallest building in, Broad, or, or in New York for many decades and is uh, actually where people used to climb if they wanted to get a view of the city. So this is where tourists used to go in New York to get a view up Broadway. You can see this view in 1872. This uh, image was drawn in 1872, 40 years before the uh, picture we just looked at. You can't see a single skyscraper. They don't exist yet. Think about if we could go back 40 years from now. 1981, how different was uh, Pittsburgh or any city in 1981 compared to now? I mean, how different was technology in the world? We still had, you know, we had uh, cars and airplanes and uh, computers, and uh, we were already bored with the fact that astronauts had landed on the moon. You could fly on a Concorde to Paris, but these people, in 1872, and this is uh, the picture on the left is uh, the people walking down Broadway where all the buildings are five stories tall. They're about to undergo some big changes in their cities. The reason buildings are five stories tall back then is because no one wanted to climb more than five flights of stairs. So let's take an example of New York and the changes. Here's New York in 1910, Lower Manhattan. This is the view of City Hall and the park in front of it. And you can see in the picture, straight ahead in the center, towering over this sort of uh, old fashioned looking, but actually new post office, the twin towers of the Park Row building. That's the 1899 tallest building in the world. It's already been supplanted on the other side of Broadway by the Singer building, which is no longer in New York. It was demolished in the 50s. but. Uh, this is 1910, and here is 1912. That's the addition of the Woolworth building. Imagine how much that must have blown people's minds. So you could go up on top to this observation deck and have a look at the skyline, looking over the railing there. It cost a quarter to ride to the top. And on your way to that observation deck, you'd walk through one of the most beautiful ornate lobbies that you could ever see. And it still exists today. You can go visit uh, this building and see the lobby. And in it, you'll see these tiny little sculptures holding up the uh, roof joists or the ceiling joists. And those are of some of the principles involved in the building. And the one you see here is Frank Woolworth himself, counting nickels and dimes. Frank Woolworth grew up on a potato farm in uh, Western New York but he hated being a potato farmer. So he went to work at a local dry goods store. He wasn't very good as a clerk, but he was very good at setting up window displays. And he saw an idea while he was working there that, that clicked with him. And that was a discount table of items that cost only a nickel. And it drew in large crowds, like a harmonica or a bar of soap, things like that. But it drew shoppers to the store, this novelty idea of being able to buy anything on the table for a nickel. So he borrowed some inventory from his boss and started his own store and then started another store and another store. And pretty soon he had hundreds of stores and just like Walmart made a fortune by selling goods at discount prices, so did Frank Woolworth. Enough money that he was able to pay for this skyscraper in cash. And by the way, you can still go up onto that observation deck. If you don't have a connection or two, this was me earlier this month. Uh, we visited New York and went on top of, my wife and I did, and we went on top of the Woolworth building. So you can see not just uh, the old skyscraper that I'm standing on, but some of the newest skyscrapers too, there in the background, some of the super talls on 57th Street and uh, Hudson Yards there facing the Hudson River. This now though is not open to the public. I said, you have to have, uh, you have to know somebody. Um, it's actually, you, you can also get up there by uh, pretending to be someone who is in the market for uh, a $79 million penthouse, which is what's on top of the Woolworth building now, but it is uh, for sale. So if you're interested in buying a five-story unfinished condo for $70 million, then you should 
look into that and you can get a tour. So I said both Chicago and New York uh, pioneered some of these early tall buildings. These, were, uh, these came about because of advances in technology and things like elevators and things like uh, steel used for structural buildings. So being able to produce mass quantities of steel as we did here in Pittsburgh. So our steel was behind many of the buildings that were built in those early days. This is a uh, 1893 illustration at the time of the great Chicago World's Fair which was a, a place where a lot of great architects from New York and Chicago and the rest of the country came together and built a massive, amazing exhibit that drew hundreds of thousands of visitors by train from all over the country to see called the White City. And it was uh, you know, great exhibition buildings. And it also had something we know from Pittsburgh called the, uh, called the Ferris wheel. You can see it there on the right. But in this drawing, you can see the tallest buildings at the time, tallest structures in America at the time in the 1890s. So uh, the big building on the left is the Masonic Hall in Chicago, which is one of the tallest skyscrapers uh, at the time. Um, then there's arguably the tallest skyscraper. It's actually taller than a building in New York. Next to it is Trinity Church, uh, which we looked at earlier and the Statue of Liberty, and of course the Capitol Dome. And then there's that Ferris wheel. I told you that uh, skyscrapers changed cities all across the country. So this one is probably familiar to you. Um, this is Pittsburgh, but the photograph is from just before 1900, about 1898, 1899. And it shows what then were the city's two skyscrapers. There are just two uh, and a skyscraper in those days meant any building that was 10 stories tall or taller. So before 1900, we had two. We had the park building, which you can see sort of in the middle. And the first skyscraper of Pittsburgh was the Carnegie building built by guess who? So both of these guys are steel industry giants. And then between the Carnegie building uh, or next to the Carnegie building on its right, you will see, well, first some uh, steeples of the Catholic church. And then next to it, or St. St. Paul's Cathedral, and then next to it is the belfry of the city county building, which was uh, the tallest thing in all of Pittsburgh at the time. So what I'm going to do is show you how much Pittsburgh changed in about a decade. Between this picture, let's say 1900 and 1912, there's those three buildings, and here's 1912. Pittsburgh was overrun in just over a decade with skyscrapers. Look at them. And then those aren't uh, trifling little skyscrapers either. They're pretty big. The one here that uh, on the right-hand side that uh, is between the courthouse belfry and the old Carnegie skyscraper is the most, uh, has the best story. That's the Frick building. So Henry Clay Frick had been Carnegie's business partner and then became his rival. And, uh, after he and Carnegie had a falling out over several things. Uh, but most, uh, the most recent argument had been over Carnegie trying to force Frick out of Carnegie Steel, where Frick was the CEO. Um, Frick contacted Daniel Burnham, a major skyscraper architect from uh, uh, Chicago, and asked him if he would build Frick an office building that would block the sun out from Carnegie's building. So you can see it effectively did that but it also sort of blocked the view of the courthouse, which is unfortunate. But you can see I'm not exaggerating that skyscrapers radically transformed cities, not just in New York, as we saw earlier, but also uh, across the country and in places like Pittsburgh. And so that's what my book is about, some of the stories of those people and their buildings. So James Park, for whom the Park Building was built, you can recognize that it still stands in Pittsburgh today. The Carnegie building is long gone, but the park building is still there. And uh, it's the top of it is, is supported by these big giant Atlas figures holding the roof up over their heads. So Park created um, a company that was called Black Diamond Steel, um, or he was the head of that company. Uh, and that's the forerunner of Crucible Steel. So I said a big steel company. 
and this building was built by George Post, who was a great New York architect and actually built the first office building that had an elevator in it. And this was for Equitable Life Insurance Company on Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Um, he also built uh, the biggest building in the world, which was at the Chicago World's Fair. Here's another great Pittsburgh skyscraper from that era. And it's my favorite because it looks so, so uh, dramatic and uh, showy. It's got these stripes and Venetian style. It's called the Erot Building. You can see in this postcard from 1907 that the person sending the postcard tells the recipient that there are a number this size here, right? So he's reporting that suddenly this city we, uh, that I'm visiting is, is overrun with skyscrapers. And he says, this is going some, which is slang of the era for uh, this is an exciting building or this is pretty cool. By the way, uh, the building was built for James Errott, who was an Irish immigrant and was in the insurance business for a while. But then he got uh, one of his, uh, one of the people that he, his insurance company covered had a foundry that made plumbing and pipes and things like the basins and, and, and other, uh, that kind of uh, plumbing supplies and that burned down. So uh, the guy took the insurance payment and, 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 and James Errett took a look at the business and decided he'd like to rebuild it and give, give it a try. So he rebuilt that business, the foundry, and started to make uh, bathtubs with enamel coating sprayed inside them so that they would be shiny and white instead of uh, tin or copper or the other materials that were used to make bathtubs. So now we've got these gorgeous looking, shiny white sanitary looking tubs and they really took off. The public loved them. So uh, James Errett made a fortune. He's the bathtub king of Pittsburgh. And uh, now that building has been transformed into a boutique hotel called The Industrialist. And that's pretty common with uh, these old time skyscrapers. The ones, the antiques that have survived uh, to the present, uh, most of them have been torn down, right? But the ones that have survived have been turned into uh, in many cases, attractive housing or boutique hotels. So this is a place where here in Pittsburgh, you can go and stay and see what it looks like. Speaking of nice hotels, one of the best stories uh, of antique skyscrapers is the story of these two, George and Louise Bolt. And they uh, made their money in the hotel business. So George came over from Germany he was, uh, he didn't have, you know, any, two, more than two nickels to rub together, but uh, he came over to New York from Germany, uh, worked in a restaurant for a while as a waiter until he made some money. And then he took that money and he went to Texas, to Galveston, to start up his own farm. And then Galveston got hit by a giant hurricane and his farm was ruined. So he went back to New York and worked as a waiter again. And George had a way about him that, uh, that uh, he was excellent in the service industry and uh, he had many wealthy patrons who appreciated uh, his work and thought he was good at being a waiter and a maitre d' and so forth. So eventually he got uh, a job at a private club in Philadelphia uh, just in time for the World's Fair that was there. And that one was the centennial of uh, the Declaration of Independence. So in 1876, uh, at the Philadelphia World's Fair, George Bolt was working in a private club where uh, the boss's daughter, Louise, caught his eye, and the two of them became an item, and they eventually got married, and then they started up their own restaurant in Philadelphia, and then a small hotel there, and Louise was very good at understanding what the wives of well-to-do uh, industrialist types wanted, and so the hotel was very popular with uh, the Nouveau Riche in Philadelphia and even people who were traveling. And one of the people that was traveling in Philadelphia was William Waldorf Astor. And when he got a chance to see how lovely the Bolts Hotel was, he asked George and Louise to come up to New York and help him build his new luxury hotel, which he wanted to call the Waldorf Hotel. And that opened in 1893 and you can see it there on the right. It says, uh, an Astor Hotel because uh, it's 
Mr. Astor who's building it, but actually it sort of uh, predicts what's happening next. I'm sure you've all heard of the Waldorf Astoria. So another member of the Astor family who owned the block or, or rather the land, the parcel of land next door uh, joined in with uh, William Waldorf Astor to build a second hotel and connect the two. And that is how we got the Waldorf Astoria. And Louise was excellent at making this hotel just really appealing for, uh, for the women, of, uh, the wives of these industrialists that were their sort of target demographics. So there were fresh cut flowers in every room and there was a tea room where men were not allowed unless they were escorted by a lady. So it became a very popular hotel and eventually this Waldorf Astoria Hotel and its success led George and Louise to decide to open their own hotel in Philadelphia to rival it. And the Waldorf Astoria still exists as a name in New York, but the hotel itself was torn down to make way for the Empire State Building, the original Waldorf Astoria was. But in Philadelphia, you can visit still today the Bellevue Stratford, which is the Bolts, uh, the Bolts Hotel from 1904. It's probably one of the loveliest antique skyscrapers that you'll see in the United States today. Um, this is a picture I took inside of, you can see the mosaic floor and the marble staircase. Um, it also has a place in history because this is where Legionnaire's disease started. There was a convention of the American Legion in 1976 and uh, there, were, uh, the, the, uh, there was a, uh, a, a pathogen that got into the air duct system of the hotel and hospitalized 130 people and 29 people died. So you can still see it. They've cleaned the air ducts now. So if you go to visit the, the Bellevue Stratford today, you can see it in all its glory. Here's another uh, skyscraper that's connected to a, a love story. This is down in Houston. It used to be the tallest skyscraper in Texas and it's called the Niels Esperson Building. It's a nice contrast to all of the mirrored skyscrapers you'll see in Houston. Um, I almost think that the mirrored skyscraper across the street lets this building kind of look at itself and admire its, uh, its reflection. But the love story is a beautiful one. It's called the Niels Esperson Building. It's named after a Danish immigrant, Niels Esperson, who, who came to the States hoping to strike it rich in the gold rush, but it didn't work out for him. So we came back to, he became a, a real estate agent um, selling plots of land and parcels of land, uh, a land developer in Oklahoma, which had been the Indian territory and was now being opened up to some settlement for, uh, for, for uh, folks from <laughs> the not Native Americans who wanted to expand their, uh, their footprint over the continent. So while he was there, he met uh, a, a girl from Kansas named Melly. And uh, so Melly and Niels got together and they went out to Denver to try to, or to Colorado to try to strike it rich in another gold rush and that didn't work. And then Niels got sick. They had to recuperate, but while they were recuperating, um, he learned about oil drilling. And so the two of them got into oil drilling and they hit it big in Texas. Um, they didn't have any children Niels and Melly. So she worked with him on the business and their holdings expanded into, they started dredging or helped to dredge the canal in Houston or the, the, the river to, to get out to the Gulf of Mexico, um, the shipping canal. And also uh, they built a movie theater, a luxury movie theater. But right about the time the movie theater opened, Niels uh, had a heart attack during a watching a play with his wife in Chicago while they were visiting an architect that they'd been talking to about maybe making a skyscraper. But before those plans had come to fruition, Niels died. But Melly uh, stepped up and decided to build the skyscraper anyway. And as I say, she named it after her husband, the Niels Esperson building. And she's the one who dug the first shovel full of dirt on the steam shovel. And she had offices up on top of the building. You can see that she's taking tea with some of her, uh, some of her, uh, let's see, her friends and, and business partners and associates. And from that roof, they were able to look out over the shipping channel. She could enjoy uh, her holdings there and look at over her domain. 
this is a great story about uh, a guy in Washington, D.C., and a little bit about the story why Washington, D.C. only has really one skyscraper. And that's this building. It's called the Cairo Building. A lot of people think that Washington, D.C. Uh, has a rule that you can't make buildings taller than the Capitol Dome or the Washington Monument. And that's not true. The reason that Washington, D.C. has so few skyscrapers is because once the first one got built, everyone got so angry about it that they passed laws to limit the height of buildings. And those laws have really not really been adjusted ever since. So the person who built it is this dashing fellow here on the right with the bike. Frank Schneider, who was a real estate developer. And uh, the building is called the Cairo building and it was built as, and, and is remains today, a residential building. And he named the building an interesting name there. It's, it's unique looking, it's called uh, the Cairo, which is not, uh, it wouldn't seem to be a strange name to choose, but the source of the name is the Chicago World's Fair. And also its design is very reminiscent of Chicago. And that's because Frank Schneider went to the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. We Pittsburghers know that the World's Fair was the home of the uh, Ferris wheel. That was the debut of the Ferris wheel by George Ferris, who was an engineer, a bridge engineer here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and sometimes we don't fully appreciate how big the Ferris wheel was. We saw an earlier image of it, but have a look at the cars there. They're basically rail cars. and how big the fair was. We'll just take a look at that. You can distantly in the background on the midway see the image of that huge Ferris wheel. But in the foreground, that's the fairgrounds. And the huge building right in the center there is, was at the time the world's biggest building. Um, it was temporary, but it's twice the size of Heinz Field. And it was full of exhibits of manufacturing and products and things like that. So this was a, an event that really, in a sense, solidified uh, Americans' views of what big buildings were supposed to look like. And for the most part, the style that was borrowed by all the great architects that contributed to this fair was called Beaux-Arts. So this is from the School of Fine Arts in Paris, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Um, and so the, the motifs are very classical or Renaissance oriented. With one exception, this building on the right is the transportation building, which was done by Louis Sullivan, who is now viewed as one of the greatest architects uh, in American history. But at the time he was sort of a young uh, go-getter and well thought of, uh, but not quite reaching the level of fame that he has since achieved. But one of his signature uh, developer, one of his signature designs was an arched doorway. So if you remember that Cairo building has an arched doorway in front of it. And why it's called the Cairo is rolling back to that uh, Ferris wheel picture. If you look at the colored postcard poster on the left, there's a little minaret. And that is because the most uh, the most popular ride or attraction rather at the World's Fair was something called a street in Cairo where you know there were snake charmers and Arabian steeds and you know you could haggle in the bazaar and so forth so it left quite an impression and people um, people associated Cairo with adventure and this big great event and so that's why the building's called the Cairo building. Now the world's most beautiful antique skyscraper has a Western Pennsylvania connection. It was built for this man, Haskell Taylor, who was from New York, who started out in the buggy and wagon business. And the reason that I say there's a Western Pennsylvania connection is because he made a lot of money supplying uh, the Union troops in the Civil War with their, with their supply wagons and then decided to move into a new industry, which was the oil drilling industry. So at first he was supplying carts to the oil prospectors in Western Pennsylvania uh, when oil was first discovered out here in the Quaker state. And um, 
eventually he saw that this was such a lucrative uh, potential that he got out of carts and instead started drilling for oil himself. And he struck a huge gusher in Butler County in a town called Petrolia. And they were you know, collecting 3000 barrels of oil a day. That's how much it was shooting out. So Haskell Taylor got rich and he hired Lewis Sullivan uh, to come on out and build him a office building in, um, in, in Buffalo, New York. He tried to get into the oil business for a while, but Rockefeller kind of was too tough of competition. So Haskell Taylor decided to heck with it. I'm just going to go into real estate and have an office building. And this is it. Now, it's not called the Taylor Building because Taylor died just before they announced construction. And so the construction company called Guarantee Construction of Chicago bought the project. And this is was at first called the Guarantee Building. Um, and then they sold the mortgage to Prudential, so it became the Prudential Building. At any rate, this is an amazingly gorgeous building that is done, it's, it's Lewis Sullivan's magnum opus. It is, uh, you know, he's coming fresh off his success at the World's Fair and built this, um, designed and built this amazing building with his specialty, which was exquisite decoration. So the ex exterior is all in these umber terracotta original designs that Sullivan came up with. And the interior is equally gorgeous. You can see this art glass skylight and the light fixture is uh, really stupendous. So you can visit there now and uh, have a little look around. They've also got a museum that you can, you can visit and, uh, and, and read all about it. San Francisco is a city with great antique skyscrapers. And in the course of writing this book, I, I visited many from coast to coast. And probably my favorite skyscraper city is San Francisco for these antiques. This is one of my favorites, the flood building. It was built uh, by the son of a man who got rich in mining named James Flood. He was a silver mining tycoon. And you can see it was built on the site of a burned down hotel. So it, when it was built, this story from I think 1902 says, uh, this building is rising Phoenix-like from the ashes of the hotel that burned down. That's kind of ironic because in 1906, most of the buildings in San Francisco burned right back again uh, because of the earthquake. Now, I was surprised when I learned that. Uh, the earthquake didn't make these new skyscrapers fall down. So if you look at this picture of the aftermath, what, what really did it for those skyscrapers was not the shaking of the ground because their steel structures were strong enough to hold them up, but it burst gas lines and water lines. And so the gas lines broke, so fire started. And with broken water lines, the fire department had very little ability to stop those fires. So they finally had to dynamite a section of the city to get the fire to stop. Well, they rebuilt the flood building and you can go visit it today. It's at the top of the BART station, the subway station, uh, right where the cable cars turn around. And if you go inside, there's a museum where you can see one of the charred beams from the fire. Now, cities, or these old buildings uh, don't have to suffer through an earthquake to be damaged. This is a building I visited in Vancouver uh, that was built for a newspaper. It was originally called the World Building, and now it's covered with scaffolding because time and weather have done a number on the terracotta design on the exterior. This building has an interesting history too. It's got a Chicago link. Um, it was built by a man who went on to be mayor of Vancouver, um, but he was, all, he was an attempted and kind of a failed newspaper publisher. So he built the skyscraper as a speculative investment. And most skyscrapers, nearly all skyscrapers are built primarily as a business proposition, as an investment. As one architect called them, they're machines that make the land pay. So they multiply the value of the land that you own by stacking extra parcels one on top of the other, which you can then rent, especially in cities where land is in high demand. You can really create a very profitable enterprise. It's said that um, 
I told you at the beginning that, um, that uh, Frank Woolworth um, paid for his skyscraper in cash. And I didn't tell you, but uh, the other interesting fact is that uh, the skyscraper paid itself off within a year. So it took him only a year to make back the construction cost of the building uh, from, his, from his rent and leases. So this building was built by uh, a man named uh, L.D. Taylor, who, as I say, was the mayor of Vancouver, but also tried to be a newspaper publisher. The reason he came to Vancouver from Chicago is because he'd run a bank in Chicago, a small private bank with a, another, uh, with another business person. And then it turned out that uh, his, his colleague, his, his colleague fled the country and ran off and uh, Taylor was charged with embezzlement. And while he was awaiting trial for cheating his, uh, the, the other investors in the bank and uh, the depositors, uh, he hopped a train and fled to Vancouver and started life over again as a newspaper man. This building is in Oakland. It's the city hall. And I just like the picture. Uh, it, it, it's built by the guy who built Pittsburgh City Hall, uh, who is uh, uh, Henry Hornbostel. So that's an ar architect who actually set up the School of Architecture in, uh, in, at Carnegie Mellon. And at the top of it, you'll see these slit windows, and those are jail cell windows. So originally, this building had a jail on the top floor because it was a functioning city hall. And you'll see right there behind me, I'm trying out one of the jail cells. They haven't really been in use since the 1960s, but um, that's uh, th that window there is uh, sort of covered over with metal now. They use this for storage, but you can see jail cells looked like. I wanna show you my favorite antique skyscraper in the country. And that is Smith Tower in Seattle. And it was, the tallest building on the West Coast for very many years, yet I'd never heard of it until I started researching this book. And so that's kind of, again, one of the purposes of this book is to uh, let you know about all these great old buildings that are all around the country that people never talk about really, um, and that can escape your attention, but they're definitely worth uh, seeking out. So this one, Smith Tower, um, was built for a New York guy from Syracuse named Lyman Smith. And this was a man who started out in the business of making shotguns. And then like a lot of gun manufacturers in New York, um, they found out that there was an even more profitable business that they could put their factories and their skilled and mechanical or their skilled mechanics who were making these fine tools and uh, you know, these very intricate processes, mechanical contraptions. Instead of making guns, they started making typewriters. And so Smith Corona, the typewriter Smith Corona is from Lyman Smith. And the Smith Tower is from that same, that same guy who started up one of the companies that became you know, one of our biggest typewriter manufacturers. So it's a typewriter headquarters. And one of the reasons that it's my favorite uh, building is because it's got a really fun museum that you can visit and try out these little typewriters. And there's also one of the few remaining original elevators. So the elevator is still the first, the elevator that was there a hundred years ago, um, you know, a couple of uh, updates have been made. So they do have a panel there where you can press buttons, but the operator still has to operate the motor for the thing to go up and down. Whoop. And it has, I have to say, a bar on top, which is pretty great. So up on top, there's this wonderful uh, bar lounge uh, restaurant with its original Chinese style decor and teak wood. And you can get a cocktail and then you can look out the windows all around you. And that's what I wanted to show you here. This is my last little slide for you. And it is the panorama from the exterior uh, observation deck. I showed you, I started out with Woolworth. So this is on the West Coast in Seattle in the Smith Tower. And wow, what a view.
it also has an expensive condo a penthouse on top now. So it's overcast there in Seattle, just like it is here in Pittsburgh. But one of the advantages of Seattle is you're surrounded by mountains. And here is your trusty cameraman trying to find the biggest one. There it is, Mount Rainier. You can see it there, poking its nose up into the cloud. And then if you turn in the other direction, past the stadium there, you see Puget Sound. And in the distance of Puget Sound are the Olympic Mountains. And then, hey, look, a Ferris wheel. So Pittsburgh's contribution to so many city skylines. Not just Ferris wheels, but the steel that made these skyscrapers. So I hope you've enjoyed our virtual tour of the world's best antique skyscrapers today. And I do urge you to, uh, to take a look at my website, hausertalks.com. On hausertalks.com, you can see uh, not only some of these stories, but you can also uh, get yourself a copy of multi-stories. And there's copies available for purchase there, but also there is a free preview of the first couple chapters that you can download. And that'll put you on my mailing list so I can let you know about other things, like the tours that I give occasionally of Pittsburgh's antique skyscraper rooftops, Three Doors Open Pittsburgh. So I hope you've enjoyed our talk today, and I hope you've learned some things about antique skyscrapers, and I hope you remember to keep looking up. Thank you.